Good evening. My name is Micah Watson. I have the privilege of directing the Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics, and I am very glad to welcome you this evening. Uh, there's been some talk lately in our national discourse about the importance of institutions, and so I hope you'll indulge me. I want to read something very quickly about the relationship between two institutions. So it's dated December 5th, 1997. Dear Cor, and that's going to be short for Corwin, Thank you for your letter of November 26 about the plans for the Henry Institute and congratulations on your appointment as executive director. I wish you the very best. It looks like an exciting prospect. Not only might we be able to cooperate in some future conferencing on the relationship between Christianity and politics, it also now looks as if our center will be developing more civic education efforts so we might be able to find ways to cooperate on your second goal of leadership development. I hope so. In any case, I look forward to future possibilities of cooperation and hope you will enjoy developing the new institute. Sincerely yours, James W. Skillen, Executive Director of the Center for Public Justice. So for 25 years, there has been a relationship, and in particular, I'd like to thank the Center for Public Justice for the valuable partnership over the last 12 years for hosting the CPJ Kuiper Lecture as part of the Henry Institute Symposium on Religion and Public Life. That said, I'd like to welcome Stephanie Summers, CEO of the Center for Public Justice, to share a few words about tonight's presentation. Thank you, Micah. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us in person and also by live stream this evening. I want to extend my gratitude to Micah and to Ellen Heckman, uh, who's in the room as well, Thank you for everything that you have done to make this evening possible. Uh, this is the 12th year we've partnered uh, with the Henry Symposium, and it's a partnership that I remain profoundly grateful for, so thank you. Our agenda tonight is simple. I'll make a few uh, remarks here for context for our lecture. I'll briefly introduce our lecturer, and we'll hear uh, a lovely lecture for our 25th Kuiper Lecture. We will see a brief video response from Shannon Q, who is one of our discussants who unfortunately was not able to be here with us in person tonight. And then we'll move uh, into a time uh, with Stanley Carlson Tees and Vince Baycoat as discussants who will make brief remarks. And then we'll have a conversation over here on these lovely chairs. Tonight's uh, discussion will also have a time of questions uh, for you to ask questions uh, to our lecturer and to our discussants as well. And then we'll head out into the hallway and have a lovely dessert reception sponsored by the Center for Public Justice. Several members of our board of trustees and our staff are here with us tonight, and we'd just be delighted if you would stick around for dessert and conversation after the lecture. So on to context. The Center for Public Justice is a nonpartisan Christian civic education and public policy organization based in Washington, D.C. We seek to inspire and equip Christians to pursue a common calling to faithful citizenship and to affirm the vital role of government in upholding public justice. Our annual Kuiper Lecture is named after the Dutch theologian and statesman Abraham Kuiper and seeks to focus attention on significant questions of religion in public life and Christ's lordship over all of creation. This evening, we actually have some of the top Kuiper scholars in the world in the room with us. So I'm going to beg their forbearance, um, as what I say next can only be the most cursory summary of Kuiper and our topic for our lecture tonight. In this evening's lecture, the ongoing problem of poverty, food insecurity, families, and faith you will hear themes informed by Kuiper's life and practice. We named this lecture um, because Kuiper believed that the Christian life cannot be confined to church life. And accepting Christ's claim of authority over the entire world, Kuiper sought to follow the implications of that faith into politics, journalism, the university, and other human endeavors. And in 1891, he gave the opening address at the first Christian Social Congress in the Netherlands, and this address, translated, is called The Problem of Poverty. Jim Skillen translated uh, this work, 
And in his translation, Jim wrote, in 1891, the social implications of the Industrial Revolution were becoming clear throughout much of Europe and America. Rapid urban growth, joblessness, family breakdown, poverty, and social squalor stood out as signs of a severe and growing crisis. So in the problem of poverty, Kuiper faces the complexity of this rapidly shifting society. In his speech, he encourages Christians and the church to take an active role in addressing the crisis. And he also points to the inevitable failure of socialistic governments to solve these problems while understanding and detailing the complex, differentiated character of modern societies. Addressing the problem of poverty isn't the responsibility of one institution, but instead requires an all-hands-on-deck response. So now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our Kuiper lecturer. Diane Schoenbach is directs the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern University and is an economist who studies policies aimed at improving the lives of children in poverty, including education, health, and income support policies. From 2015 to 2017, she served as the director of the Hamilton Project at the Brookings Institute in Washington, DC. She's also a senior research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and a research associate at the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Schauzenbach is currently researching the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on food insecurity. So now I'd like to welcome you. We're going to need my slides to come back up, so I'm going to get tech up here, uh, and hopefully tech will fix this. Um, but I'm going to start in the meantime, because my first slide doesn't come up for a couple of minutes. So thank you. It is such a tremendous honor to be giving the Kuiper Lecture this year, and I'm grateful to Stephanie Summers and everyone at the Center for Public Justice for this invitation. I'm deeply grateful to CPJ for its investments in me over the years, especially the Kivitas program that I participated in as, as a graduate student way back last century that helped me build a framework for thought as a Christian academic. Now often the Kuiper Lecture is given by a political philosopher or a theologian. Uh, for better or worse, and I hope this isn't the first year hearing of this, I'm an economist. Now, we, we economists were once known as the worldly philosophers, but in recent decades, we're more appropriately known to be dismal scientists. <laughs> but come to think of it, I probably don't have to apologize for being dismal in a room full of fellow Calvinists. <laughs> so to prepare for this lecture, I reread Kuiper's The Problem of Poverty, Jim Skillen's translation, and in it, he was encouraging the church to come to terms with the challenges being posed by the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution ushered in new tools for large-scale production. Now, in time, these new tools resulted in sharply increased productivity, and along with that came rapidly rising living standards. But these results did not come immediately. In the short run, as the economy adjusted, there was massive economic disruption. Workers lost their livelihoods as new forms of capital displaced labor, and the people who were displaced from their jobs suffered great economic hardship. To be sure, Kuiper was correct to urge the church to wrestle with what these economic changes meant for the distribution of income, for social needs, and for human dignity. Today, we're facing a similar tectonic shift in our economic system as we enter what's known as the new machine age. These economic trends are having profound impacts on our families and on society. Further, the economic shifts are disproportionately impacting people who are already economically vulnerable, such as those with low levels of education and blacks, Hispanics, and immigrants. They're also disproportionately harming children and threatening to have lifetime impacts on them. The distributional consequences should particularly concern us because, as we know, Christians have a special responsibility to the least of these. Across scripture, there's great attention given to the poor and our responsibilities to the poor. 
In our day, as in Kuiper's, the church must address the challenges posed by economic change and poverty. Now, to be sure, the causes and consequences of poverty in the United States are deeply complex. In our time together, I'd like to discuss two related issues from my work in economics that I believe the church should be taking more seriously. The first is the future of work, and the second is our corporate responsibility to children. I hope that my presentation and the discussion we have will help us all better pray, act, and give to address the ongoing problem of poverty. No, no, no luck on the slides, huh? Well, I got, I got a lot of uh, interesting uh, trends that I would like to be showing you up here. Is tech not gonna show? Yeah. All right, has somebody at least gone back to find us? Okay, all right, good, 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 good. All right, uh, so much like when Kuiper was writing the problem of poverty during the Industrial Revolution, so too today the nature of work in the economy is rapidly changing. Today, stunningly agile machines can perform complex tasks that increasingly replace labor in assembly and manufacturing industries. But machines aren't stopping there. Machines are enhancing the productivity of, and in many cases, displacing service workers. You see this in restaurants when you order from kiosks or when you use the self-checkout line at the grocery store. Machines are also coming after knowledge workers. Human tax preparers are being replaced by TurboTax. Advanced electronic searching tools are reducing the need for paralegals and other researchers. And computing speed and big data are promising or are threatening to impact so many aspects of our lives. Trade, too, is causing large shifts in our economic system. China recently quickly ascended as a world manufacturing power, and research has traced the devastating effect of new imports from China on employment, especially in geographic areas with high concentration of affected industries, like furniture making and equipment manufacturing. And because our economy is so interconnected, what's bad for the local factory also harms other aspects of the economy, from the suppliers that once served the factory to the local grocery stores, restaurants, and movie theaters where the workers once spent their wages. Now, I should be quick to say that most economists like me think that, just in the case, as was the case in the wake of the Industrial Revolution during Kuiper's time, before too long, these forces of technology and trade will bring more prosperity New jobs we can't even dream of right now will be created. But in the meantime, people are losing their jobs to machines or to imports and are experiencing the economic and psychological pains of job loss. Others don't directly experience job loss, but are never even hired in the first place. They're essentially displaced before they even get a foothold in the job market. Wages across vast swaths of our labor market have been stagnant for decades. Many people are left vulnerable, including many hardworking adults who have lost or soon will lose their jobs due to shifts in economic forces that are beyond their control. All right, so here is where the first slide was gonna come, but um, if we get the slide to come up, uh, what it will show you is a slowly declining trend that in indicates for us that millions of Americans are no longer engaged in work. The rate of men's employment has been declining steadily over the past half century. I can talk about labor force participation, which includes both those employed and those who are unemployed but are looking for a job. Back in the 1960s, nearly all of prime-aged men between ages 25 and 54 were employed. And over the decades, there has been a long, steady decline in men's employment, such that by 2016, about one out of every nine prime-age men were not working. If these trends continue, this number could be as high as one out of every four men in the year 2050. The decline is not primarily driven by ages, aging, such as the baby boom generation getting older and retiring, but represents a declining likelihood of working across all age cohorts. These declines haven't been experienced uniformly across groups. Men without a college degree and black men have seen larger declines. Now studies show that reductions in the demand for labor, especially for men with low levels of education, are an important component in this decline in employment. For many of these men, especially those in manufacturing, the economy has just simply shifted under their feet. Trade and technology have reduced the demands for the skills that they have, and jobs that they once relied on have been permanently eliminated. 
Now, on the other hand, reductions in labor supply, that is, men choosing not to work despite opportunities to do so, also explain some of the troubling downward trend in employment, but only a relatively small share of it. Now, offsetting this trend from 1960 to about the year 2000, women's employment was increasing enough to offset the decline in men's employment, so our overall employment was rising as a nation. But in recent decades, since about the year 2000, women's labor force participation had also been falling. This has occurred across the board for single and married women, mothers and childless women alike. Now, women's non-participation in employment appears to be different from men. For example, women who aren't in the labor force are likely to be caring for children or caring for the elderly, not employment, but without question, still productive work. If we put both of these trends into international perspective, I can say that trade and technology have been impacting employment the world over in all developed countries, and men's employment has been declining everywhere. But unfortunately, the decline has been somewhat sharper in the United States than in other OECD countries like Canada, the UK, and Japan. Now, on the other hand, women's employment has been continuing to grow the world over. We really stand out as being different in this. Other countries have not seen the same decline in women's employment. So there are many factors that are causing these trends, and policy solutions to reverse the decline in labor force participation just simply won't be easy because the economy is changing and tasks that once supported jobs and communities here are now done increasingly by machines or in factories abroad. Of course, anyone who's followed the economic change in the state of Michigan over the last decades surely understands these forces. And the church must wrestle deeply with these trends because we know that engagement in productive work is fundamental to human flourishing. It's reflected in God's placement of Adam in the garden to tend it in Genesis 2 prior to the fall. When people aren't engaged in productive work, they suffer. And studies bear this out too. Men who experience job loss have higher mortality. That's not what I was looking for, but thanks. Uh, men who experience job loss have higher mortality rates, they lose a sense of purpose, and they report, frankly, just being unhappy. And we can improve the situation somewhat through increased education and training, both for the young and also for older workers who need to retrain for new jobs in the changing economy. But this is an easier proposition for the young than it is for older displaced workers nearing retirement age. Of course, the economic benefit to retraining drops sharply as a worker ages because there's just less time to recoup the investment in more schooling. For some, the economically best option may just be to go ahead and retire early from employment. But this can come at a huge cost to human dignity unless they find other ways to be engaged in work more broadly. We know that employment's not the only route to productive work, and we should all help support ways to engage those people who are no longer employed with different meaningful opportunities to work and serve their communities. As my former pastor Craig Barnes would often say, we need to help these displaced workers work out the theology of Plan B. Addressing, adding to the economic challenges we face are wage trends. Uh, wages for full-time workers with less than a college degree have been relatively flat over the last several decades. People with a bachelor's degree, men with a bachelor's degree, have seen uh, growth in their wages in the late, late, late 1990s, but their wages, too, have remained relatively flat for essentially 20 years. It's only men with the highest levels of education, more than a bachelor's degree, that have consistently seen wage growth over the years, essentially a doubling of real wages over the last 60 years. For women, the trends for everyone except high school dropouts are a little bit better than they are for men but also reflect substantial stagnation for anyone less than a college degree. Great to see you. All right, we'll get, this, uh, we'll get this fixed up, and hopefully you'll gasp at my next slide, my next slide. That was quite, I would never have uh, picked that one. This, this is pictures of, of the wage growth. This lack of real wage growth means that more working families will just struggle to make ends meet, especially as prices of housing and education have risen in real terms. 
They face more economic uncertainty and are at a higher risk of hardship despite being attached to the labor market. In fact, my research finds that fully 85% of households with children that are food insecure are headed by adults who work but just struggle to make ends meet because they don't earn enough. It also means that more working families will qualify and rely on social safety net programs like food stamps, which increasingly serves as wage support for low earners. Now these economic trends, as well as broader shifts in social norms, have had a profound impact on the family. This figure, that may cause you to gasp, follows the share of children living in households with married parents over time by mother's education level. At the beginning of this period, in 1976, over four in five children lived with married parents. Back then, there were some differences in marriage rates across mother's education level, but these were relatively modest, at least for those with at least a high school degree or more. Now, over the la next last 40 years, the share of children with college-educated mothers who were living with married parents, which is shown in blue on top here, has remained relatively steady, hovering around 90%. But the marriage rates for mothers with only a high school diploma or some college have fallen sharply, as you see in the yellow and the green lines. Today, only three in five children in these families live with married parents. Now, overwhelmingly, this shift is not driven by an increase in divorce rates, but an increase in the share of mothers who were never married in the first place. This is undoubtedly harmful to children for myriad reasons for surely two parents are better than one. Let me highlight some of the economic consequences and causes of these trends. Fewer parents in the household means that children are more vulnerable to economic risks and are more likely to suffer economic hardships like food insecurity. Now the role of the economy in contributing to the decline in marriage has itself changed over time. In the economic model of marriage, the likelihood a woman decides to get married and has children increases as her potential mate's earnings rise. And we've already discussed, men with lower levels of education saw their earnings stagnate or decline. So it's not surprising from an economics perspective to see declining marriage rates. Unfortunately, the social norms may have eroded so much that we may not even see this trend reverse even when economic opportunity improves. I base this concern on recent studies that show that the relationship between men's economic opportunities and marriage rates have changed over time. Back in the 1980s, the coal boom increased wages for men in coal mining and related industries who generally had low levels of education. Now in response to these raises that they got, more of the men got married and had children just as the economic model of marriage would predict. Now more recently, the fracking boom again has led to increased wages for some men with lower levels of education. This time, the studies are showing that the men earning higher wages are behaving differently. The raise still means that they're more likely to have children, but now they're having children without getting married. Whatever the remedy may be for this trend, and I pray that, they, that there is a remedy, it will have to involve a broader change in societal norms and culture, and not merely economic fortunes. So this leads me to my second theme, which is that we're not doing enough to protect and invest in children in the United States, and that we should do more. So to start, a large share of people live in households that struggle to provide for their basic needs. This slide shows the annual rate of food insecurity in 2020. Food insecurity means that a family has been classified based on a series of questions about their resource availability, not to have adequate resources to provide the food that they need. As shown in this graph, over, just over 10% of American households were food insecure in 2020, shown in the bar in blue. Nearly 15% of households with children were food insecure, as shown in yellow. Now note that this measure is not the same as hunger, but is a broader measure of, of hardship. Only about 4% of households uh, experience hunger in the United States. And this me measure is also different from the poverty rate, which is designed, de defined as the share of people with income below a given threshold. Although, as it turns out, the overall rates of poverty and food insecurity are relatively similar. 
But as an economist, I like to talk about food insecurity because it's indicative of the share of families that are experiencing hardship, such as running out of money between paychecks, having to cut back on food in order to pay the heating bill, or to get their car fixed. Indeed, about one third of people who experience food insecurity have incomes that are sufficiently high that they generally aren't eligible for food support programs like SNAP or free school meals. As a result, they're more likely to need to rely on private charity to help them get through when they fall on tough times. Now, I emphasize here that rates of economic hardship are uniformly higher for families with children. And this should be troubling to us for a number of reasons, including that the fact that poverty and economic hardship can do lasting damage to children. You'll notice here also the large racial and ethnic disparities. More than one in five black families with children experienced food insecurity last year. In general, blacks are two to three times as likely as whites to be in poverty and to be food insecure. And unfortunately, this ratio seems to hold steady both in good economic times and in bad ones. Rates for Hispanics fall in between blacks and whites and from a statistical perspective, tend to fluctuate more with economic conditions like the unemployment rate. Now, of course, we have a social safety net to help families either temporarily or chronically experiencing economic hardship. It's made up of a patchwork of programs that differ in terms of their design features and who they're targeting. So the graph here shows the reduction in poverty made by different programs of the social safety net for the pro population overall in blue and for children in yellow. Of course, by design, different programs help different subgroups of the population. For example, on the left, Social Security retirement benefits lift a large share of adults, especially the elderly, out of poverty. Now, our safety net for children is primarily made up of programs that incentivize and reward parents' work or provide in-kind benefits like meals and vouchers for food and housing. For example, the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is the second from the left, provides strong incentives for parents' employment because it only provides benefits to workers. This is the program that has the largest anti-poverty impact on children, reducing their poverty rate by 6.4 percentage points. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, shown next, which used to be known as food stamps, provides food assistance to anyone with income and assets levels below the eligibility threshold, but disproportionately helps families with children in part because they have lower incomes. School meals, uh, shown second from, from the right here, provide breakfast and lunches to school children, both preventing hunger and reducing poverty. TANF, the cash welfare program all the way on the right, today has very little anti-poverty impact. The patchwork of safety net programs work both together and separately to reduce poverty and economic hardship. Now, I'd be remiss in this audience if I didn't take a moment to address why private charity alone is not enough to combat poverty. The primary reason for this comes down to a collective action pro problem, as described by Milton Friedman in his classic 1962 book, Capitalism and Freedom, which is must reading. If we each give voluntarily and pool our money to address a corporate problem like poverty, each one of us pays only a small share of the total. And the incentive for each of us to reduce our individual contributions just a little bit reduces the overall pot that we would have to address poverty. But this would happen over and over, and we would each pull back a little bit, a little bit, uh, with each of us pocketing a little of our intended donations until we as a group have too little to meet the challenge. Simple collective action problem. Now, I also add to this argument that private charity and the role of the church in addressing poverty should be different from the government's. That is, the church, we should put more of our efforts into areas of our own comparative advantage. From the safety net perspective, a substantial amount of research points me to the conclusion that as a society, we're not doing en enough to help children and families struggling with poverty and economic hardship. So here I'll describe findings from my own research that's been able to study the long-term effects of lifting children out of poverty. In this work, my co-authors and I study the impact of the original introduction of the food stamp program in the 1960s and 1970s across the United States. Food stamps were an important part of the war on poverty and were introduced rather slowly over a 13-year period on a county-by-county -county basis. 
For those of you who don't know, food stamps provides vouchers to buy food at grocery stores and generally increased a family's total resources by 15 to 20 percent. Because of the staggered introduction of the program, we can measure the impact of the program on children, comparing different families living in the same state but in different counties. Think of the study this way. One low-income family starts receiving extra resources from food stamps starting, let's say, in 1967. The low-income family in the neighboring county doesn't start receiving those resources until, let's say, 1972, when the program was finally introduced in their area. We use this variation to understand the impact of the additional resources in childhood by comparing these families. So we can go a step further by comparing children who were different ages when the food stamps were introduced. So we can measure the difference in the impact if a child was in utero, or age two, or age eight when the program started. We can then follow the children into adulthood, relating their outcomes as adults to the differences in their circumstances when they were children, as driven by differences in food stamp policies based on where they lived. We measure their health in adulthood and their economic circumstances, both for the siblings who received the additional resources on the early side and those in the neighboring county who didn't receive additional resources until they were older. We find that the additional resources provided by food stamps improved a range of adult outcomes for children who were aided by the program. To start, we find that children who were in utero when food stamps began they were born with higher birth weights, and a host of research suggests that improved health at birth will translate into better outcomes later in life. And we find that this is true when we can directly measure it. But the benefits don't stop there. Older children are also helped. Low-income children with access to food stamps are more likely to graduate from high school because they can pay more attention in school. They also grow up to be healthier, including having less obesity, less diabetes, less health, heart disease. We find that the women in particular grow up to have better economic outcomes, including being more likely to be employed, earning more, and themselves being less likely to be impoverished as adults. This kicked off a whole literature, and subsequent work finds that criminal activity is lower among these children as their adults as well. Since our paper, many other studies have followed, looking at other aspects of the safety net. From these, we've learned that all sorts of other investments in the form of cash welfare benefits, the earned income tax credit, even health insurance, have similar impacts. There's strong payoffs to improving the quality of early life environments. We also find that there's strong lifetime payoffs to improving the quality of schools. Childhood is a very con consequential time to make investments that last a lifetime. The foundations laid during childhood in terms of health, education, character development, and more, these deeply influence the quality of children's economic and social lives as adults. Yet many children in the United States don't have the resources or the relationships they need to build strong foundations. Too many families live with inadequate economic resources, a situation which hurts children in both the short run and the long run. Now, when study after study after study shows that there are substantial payoffs to relatively modest additional investments in children, social investments in children, leads economists like me to the conclusion that we're systematically underinvesting in children. Indeed, less than 10% of the federal budget goes to spending on children. Now, I'd also say that too many Christians appear to believe that our policy responsibility to children ends at the point of their viability. It does not. Of course, we can have differences, and we will have differences, of opinion about specific policies, legislative priorities, but I want to argue that we should agree on the broad principle we should be doing more for children in the policy sphere to support opportunities for the children to grow and thrive. Now, both our private and our public actions should reflect this. Of course, I've spoken a lot here about the safety net because that's what I study, but that's only one piece of what our corporate response should be. We should consider how our individual actions help children. For example, another study of mine that was once featured on the front page of the New York Times shows the lifetime impact of having an excellent teacher. An excellent teacher bestows on her students 
an additional three quarters of a million dollars in lifetime economic outcomes relative to a more mediocre teacher. Makes me conclude that Christians who are teachers should strive for excellence in the classroom. There are so many other measurable impacts of ways that we invest in children in our communities as librarians, coaches, scout troop and youth group leaders and tutors. There are many, many ways that we can invest in children. So let me conclude by briefly summarizing what I hope you take away. First is that too many Americans live in poverty and face food hardship, and this is especially damaging to children. Now, while to be sure, some of this is the result of bad choices that are made by people as a result of our shared human condition. So too macroeconomic trends in wages and employment that are beyond any individual's control drive much of the economic hardship that we see. As Christians, we need to pray, act, and give in response to these trends. In doing so, we should recognize the correct role for the church and for government. Some portion of our assistance to the poor should be targeted money, especially directed to the poor who are working but just have been harmed by stagnant wages and rising housing costs and other economic forces. And the government is simply better at the relatively easy work of collecting money and distributing checks. On the other hand, the church has a big advantage in walking beside people who are struggling and helping them overcome problems stemming, as Kuiper frames it, from error and sin. Scripture teaches us that we have a special responsibility to the poor and to the vulnerable. This should permeate our prayers, our private actions, and our policy endorsements as we seek to love and serve God and our neighbors in these changing economic times. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. In a few minutes, I'll introduce and invite our discussants up on stage. Um, but first, I think we're going to hear from Shannon Q by video. Um, Shannon was a 2019 recipient of CPJ's Hatfield Prize, which awards a cash prize to student faculty research teams at Council for Christian Colleges and Universities schools. Students study a social problem from a neo kyperian perspective and produce a policy report that details the issue, recommends public policy solutions, and provides exemplary responses of civil society institutions. Shannon, with her faculty advisor, Dr. Stephen Baldridge, authored A Hidden Crisis, Food Insecurity on College Campuses, copies of which would, are available tonight out on our display table in the lobby or online at sharedjustice.org. Shannon presented her research at the Henry Symposium in the spring of 2019. And Shannon is currently a school social worker um, and was really delighted to provide remarks by video and really sad that she can't be here tonight. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shannon Q, and I am so sorry that I can't be in the room with you all tonight, but in this instance, I am very grateful for technology. I am a school social worker in Abilene, Texas, and I was a 2019 Hatfield Prize recipient, during which I researched college students' food experiences with food insecurity. I am also grateful to have kept in touch with CPJ since then. My official path towards researching food insecurity amongst college students began then, but I could not have anticipated continuing that work today. My work through the Hatfield Prize greatly impacted both my professional and personal life. Since finishing the report, I centered my graduate thesis on the same topic, spoke at TEDx, hosted trainings for faculty and staff within higher education, K through 12 education, and for community organizations. And I'm continuing to work with my alma mater and the community to best support our students today. Most recently, the biggest project that I'm working on 
is a community grant funded, funded program called Carry Out Community that is striving to provide students with both immediate and long-term assistance for food security through direct food provision to advocacy, as well as conducting research to help inform not only our initiatives, but to keep campuses aware of and accountable to the very real needs of their student body. Bringing my implications and research to life in such tangible ways has been an exhilarating and exhausting process. I hope that this work encourages the continuation of this conversation surrounding food insecurity amongst college students and overall, and encourages others to take actionable steps in their community. On a more personal note, my work through the Hatfield Prize has pushed me beyond my comfort zone in more ways than one. From doing more public speaking to more hands-on research than I thought I'd be doing as an undergraduate, graduate, and postgrad. And I'm so thankful for the whole experience, particularly for the mentors and friends I've gained along the way through CPJ. I never anticipated that I'd continue this research and advocate for students years later, but God does cool things with people who are willing to say yes, or who might have problems saying no but I'm working on that. Additionally, through my writing and research for Hatfield, I was able to not only see, but be a part of the conversation between faith and public policy, that the two are not only intrinsically intertwined, but have significant influence on each other and deeply impact people in such personal and systemic ways. I'm grateful for the opportunities I've had to listen to the boots on the ground people and organizations who recognize this issue long before me and with me and are striving to do something about it. In light of COVID, the ways that basic needs and securities, particularly food insecurity, is being discussed more openly and in a variety of spaces, such as college campuses, I feel that this work is more timely than ever not just for those working in higher education or who are in college or who know a college student right now, but for those who believe in equity and justice, such as people of faith. I truly believe that in regards to loving our neighbor, ensuring that people have equitable access to as basic of a necessity as food is something that we can all get on board with beyond the celebratory or consoling casseroles. Food insecurity is an issue that gripped my heart as a social worker, person of faith, and a human being. And again, while I am so sad that I cannot be with you all in person, I am grateful for this opportunity to share a little bit about my work and my heart with you all. Thank you, and I wish you well. Now I'd like to invite two folks to make responses to Diane's remarks. Um, and I'm gonna introduce them sequentially and then just come up on stage. We won't break you up. Um, so Stanley Carlson Tease is the founder and senior director of the Institutional Religious Freedom Alliance, which is a division of the Center for Public Justice. And as part of this role, he convenes the Coalition to Preserve Religious Freedom, which is a multi-faith alliance of social service, education, and religious freedom organizations that advocates for the religious freedom of faith-based organizations to Congress and to the federal government and engages and advises federal and state officials to develop policies and practices to this end. He served in the inaugural office of faith-based and neighborhood partnerships at the White House. His recent contribution to the Rutledge Handbook of Religious, religious Literacy, Pluralism, and Global Engagement focuses on faith-based social services. And he is also the co-author with Stephen Monsma of Free to Serve, protecting the free religious freedom of faith-based organizations. Also, you'll hear from Vincent Baycote, professor of theology and director of the Center for Applied Christian Ethics at Wheaton College. Dr. Baycote is a fellow of the Center for Public Justice. He is a member of the Evangelical Theological Society and the Society of Christian Ethics and writes for a broad swath of journals, including Books and Culture, Christianity Today, Christian Scholars Review, and Comment Magazine, many others. He's the author of Reckoning with Race and Performing the Good News, 
He has also authored The Political Disciple, A Theology of Public Life, and The Spirit in Public Theology, Appropriating the Legacy of Abram Kuyper, as well as a contributor to many other works. Stanley and I decided that I would go first. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Diane, for, for your lecture. In 1891, one of the central factors uh, in Kuiper's address is not unique to neo-Calvinism. And that's the fact that poverty emerges because of several ways humans are not honored as those created in the image of God. Well, of course, there are matters of personal responsibility, and Kuiper wanted to encourage that. Then as now, part of the reason for poverty stems from the dehumanization that occurs through economic, technological, social, and political changes. Kuiper strongly emphasized the importance of attending to the poor among us. A truth we cannot escape if we take God's word seriously. We only need to read Matthew 25, 31 to 46 to see this must be a priority. Though it does make me wonder uh, to, you know, to eat, ask each of you this question, which is, in the churches you attend, or the range of churches you've attended, where has poverty been uh, among the things that are areas of attention or when we talk about um, the lives of faithfulness that we are to pursue? Just, I always wonder, how, how much do we talk uh, about that when the scripture does talk about it a lot. Second, while greatly concerned about lack of income, this is very interesting. In, in, in 1891, this is where he said he did not, Kuiper did not encourage a very large government sponsored financial safety net. Now, does this mean that he would oppose what we have heard this evening? That is very hard to say. It's very hard to say because Kuiper wrote a particular time and because he wrote for the occasion. I think one of the most important things if you're dealing with Kuiper is to remember that one of the reasons he was called a neo-Calvinist is because he was looking at the time in which he lived and then he was contextualizing Calvinism for his moment. And, it, and, and especially this whole part about him writing for the occasion. Sometimes what people do with Kuiper is they cut and paste. They go, well, you know what Kuiper said then. Well, I think it's interesting to think about where he lived and where we live. He lived in the Netherlands, a little bit smaller than the United States of America. So it's hard to talk about what he would say about a country this size. For certain, we must recognize that Kuiper was concerned not to undermine the resilience of the working poor. And he also felt there was a strong need for Christians to have a much stronger sense of what he called giving for Jesus' sake. In his view, state assistance was a blot on the church. Now, that's in the lecture. But like I said, he lived in a country far smaller than the United States, and we can't assume he would look at the data this evening and conclude if only the church gave more, then we would address all of this. Now, sometimes people say that. Uh, in fact, I'm reminded of when Paula White said something similar at a certain event at a certain church in Texas. And T.D. Jakes said this. He said he had run the numbers. And he said, the scale is too great for the church alone to attend to these crises. Now, I'm sure that at a Kuiper lecture, nobody was expecting the names Paula White and T.D. Jakes to show up. <laughs> Just consider it a kind of a cameo appearance tonight. But, but it is important to, I think, to, to note that, because sometimes people say, well, if the church was just doing what it would do, then it would take care of everything. I think because of the scale, uh, that's a problem, much less what go, what's going on at the moment with giving in churches to begin with. As we think about a, what I would call a Kuiper-informed response, it is important to acknowledge that he does not give us much in the way of specific policy prescriptions. He did encourage efforts to discern policies that emerge from the truths of scripture and are in accordance with what he called the ordinances of creation. This is a great task of interpretation of the ethical imperatives of the faith 
and of what is really an experimental enterprise for, of creating and trying out policies that are in accordance with what God desires for human flourishing. Today, I think this would mean the need to be creative in our public policy aspirations while also being willing to keep trying as we see the relative effectiveness and helpfulness of policies when put into practice. And the reason I want to say that is because I think sometimes what Christians want to do is, well, let's see if we can get like the biblical policy and try to put that into practice. Well, you know, none of us sees all that clearly and none of us knows that much. So, and none of us can, has the kingdom of God policy. So it's going to be throwing it at a wall and refining it no matter what we do. So, so how much energy are we putting towards our willingness to be creative and just to keep being about reinvention when it comes to public policy? When I think about CPJ, the host of this lecture, it's important to note two of its commitments. One is the belief that Christians, as in all of them, should contribute to the renewal of public life. And second, the importance of encouraging office holders and citizens to take their responsibilities seriously. I think that's important because, you know, we heard at the dinner tonight that, you know, CPJ does a lot of this work that's beneath and that's kind of invisible. Well, you know, what most people do is not making the news. What most of the people in our congregations do isn't going to show up on the news. But what if more of the people in our congregations were taking their citizenship dimensions seriously as expressions of their discipleship? What, what would that mean? The challenges of poverty before us are daunting. But all members of God's church have a role to play. If he were here, and, and if he were here, he would definitely have strong opinions. Kuiper would urge us to be honest about the challenges, even while encouraging us to keep trying to find ways to show that faithfulness as citizens and as members of congregations, it includes not only seeing the poor, but trying to see to it that new paths of flourishing emerge even as the conditions of society keep changing. He would tell us to keep at it. Sometimes we look at what's daunting and it can kind of you know, make you feel a sense of paralysis. But he would tell us, keep going, keep trying, keep experimenting, and let's see what elements of flourishing we can put into the world, locally to internationally. Thanks. So among other things, I want to applaud Diane for not being um, put off base by the technological problems. Um, I've had those myself in various talks, and I'll tell you, it's not the uh, most productive way to uh, try to get a message across. <clears throat> so I'm honored to be uh, a commentator, uh, honored to be part of this Kuiper Lecture, and uh, to be on the stage eventually with Vince and Diane and uh, Stephanie. And I'm glad that you're here as well. Um, I heard in your talk, Diane, some important things about persistent poverty that don't really end up in the public discussion very much. And I don't hear it in public policy debates. I don't hear it in public into, uh, economics uh, commentary either. Among other things, I heard that people and families are poor, who are poor are not all poor in exactly the same way or for the exact same reasons and therefore, the kind of help that will be genuinely helpful might need to be more than economic, more than giving money and services, and it may differ depending on what the exact problem is. So I want to co comment on three aspects of that. First, as she indicated, one of the complex contributors to poverty in the United States is failing marriages, but especially the low rate of marriage formation. And you know from your experience, perhaps, we you can think about it, that single parents with children have less income than two working parents. Uh, they don't have a partnership to share the load when one person is sick. They have more need and less income to pay for childcare. They have less emotional and other support for advancement in a job or to cope with the difficulties of life in this broken world. This is a serious dimension of 
the problem of poverty that our society does not want to deal with seriously, as far as I can see. We believe in freedom and in advancing ourselves and not so much in marriage faithfulness. But the message of the Bible is different. It teaches love for others, the importance of marriage, the responsibilities of parents to each other and to their children, and that we should put our ultimate trust in God and not in our own happiness. That makes me ask, how can the church more effectively teach our own members about marriage and then our society to to value marriage despite difficulties that might be part of it? And then what role can government play in encouraging marriages? Extremely hard question. But also, what things should government stop doing in its anti-poverty programs that might be discouraging the formation of marriages? So these are, I think, extremely complex problems, but seem to me important to think about. A second remark, Diane rightly notes something not often heard these days in scholarly and policy discussions about how to effectively fight poverty, and that is that the church might have a vital role to play. It has a vital role in upholding the value of marriage, for one thing. Um, It also has a positive role, as she said, in walking alongside people who are struggling in their poverty and unemployment as they wonder about purpose and direction, and it runs a range of uh, programs. But I think we should say more than that as well, if you had more time. There isn't just a church, Kuiper used that language too, but, and I mean that not just that there are more denominations and other faiths, but what I mean is that you and I, as part of the church, also have other roles that are relevant, and one of them is a citizenship role, but there are many other roles that we have that are important to the problem of poverty. The government official who knows the teachings of the Bible should not just help the poor by supporting their church's food pantry, that would be one way the church helps out, but also should bring her biblical wisdom about the importance of marriage, for example, to her task of designing the details of government income support programs. Right? So it's right through her vocation that her concern as a member of the church should come. The professor at Calvin University should not just be motivated to volunteer to serve Thanksgiving dinners to the homeless, as important as that is, but perhaps is being called to contribute his wisdom to creating a more accurate measure of poverty or to write an illuminating analysis of some unusual private faith-based anti-poverty program that actually has been helping families get from debilitating poverty to a place where they can help their neighbors in need. There isn't just the church as a general concept, but there are Christians in all our callings in life. And we ought to come to the aid of the poor through our vocations and our specific expertise. Third and briefly, Diane noted the important anti-poverty role of the safety net, which she named as a diverse set of government programs to help people in need, income programs, uh, free school meals, childcare subsidies, and so on. I, I wanna just kind of make that more complex than she was able to do. Besides the many government programs, of course there are many private programs, many of them related to the church or to religion. For example, in my view of the social safety net, we'd have to include the National Network of Jewish Social Services that offers a wide range of anti-poverty services both to Jews and to non-Jews. And I also came to my mind was World Relief, a program of the National Association of Evangelicals, which partners with congregations around the country to help refugees in their poverty make a new life in the United States, right? So the social safety net, I think, is comprised not only of government programs, but also of many private programs that come to people's aid. And there's an additional reality. Many of those private programs actually are funded in part by government. So this is a very complex reality. In our social safety net, Many programs we think of as government programs are actually carried out by private organizations, including faith-based private organizations. Those free school breakfasts and lunches, for example, are funded by the federal government, and they're provided to students, not just in public schools, but also in a wide variety of faith-based private schools who have to agree to play that role. And much of the funding for World Relief's refugee resettlement program comes from the federal government, or we could put it the other way around. The federal government could not carry out its refugee resettlement program, which has important anti-poverty effects, if World Relief and other faith-based organizations refuse to partner with it to activate congregations to help the poor. 
Given this vital role of faith-based organizations in the social safety net, one important policy I think we should all support is government protection for the religious freedom they need so that they can bring their distinctive contributions in that partnership with the government. In his book, The Problem of Poverty, Abraham Kuyper said, and I just want to quote one short thing. He said, where our Father in heaven wills with divine generosity that an abundance of food grows from the ground, that would certainly be our country, we are without excuse if, through our fault, this rich bounty is divided so unequally that one is surfeited with bread or overstuffed, while another goes with an empty stomach to his pallet and sometimes must even go without a pallet. You know, that made me think. We can look around and say, I think the way we do things makes a lot of sense, but if that's what happens, it doesn't make enough sense. Is that not right? There's something wrong for all the things we think are going right if people are in such a difficult uh, places. And when you and I look around, we may think, well, the problem of poverty is not so big in our country. I don't see it. Well, we've been reminded tonight that it is a large, serious, and always changing challenge. Christians, as Diane reminded us, must be deeply concerned about this grave problem. But of course, we must not just be concerned we have to be active. So that raises the question of what Jesus calls you to do, you with your particular talents, your particular experience, and your particular place in life. Thank you. We started a little bit late, so I'm going to ask one question, and then we're going to start taking questions from the room. So um, we all have, many of us have probably had the experience, I know I have, um, of hearing this question that sort of came up in the discussion, um, you know, if the church would just do the church's job, uh, you know, we could fix this problem. Um, how would you counsel people sort of best respond to that question in relationship to the conversation that we've had tonight, the topics we've talked about tonight. And I get to go first? Sure. <clears throat> so isn't poverty just a problem that the church ought to respond to? I think the first thing I've said, and this has come up often in Washington, D.C., as welfare reform is discussed and so on, the first thing I've said to people is nobody is stopping the church from doing more. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we have this problem that people that claim to know that Jesus tells them to do something aren't doing it. And so I'll just quote from uh, Jonathan Edwards, an imperfect man. He wrote, I had a whole sermon series on charity and he said charity is so important. But he said, people are fickle and they're sinful and they often don't do what needs to be done when somebody's in a crisis. And for that reason, God gave us government that will just make people do what they ought to do for the sake of their neighbors, even when you don't feel like you want to be generous. So I say to the church, do more. Nobody's stopping you. Um, I would, I'm going to use, uh, well, this is a word that actually here at Calvin, it's, people know this word, catechesis is the word. In other words, when I was asking about, hey, take a survey of your church and how much are people talking about poverty at their churches? Of course, I don't know how much people are talking about poverty at anybody's church here because, you know, no little signs popped above your head like with a percentage telling me anything. So I don't know whether your church says anything about poverty or whether your church talks about poverty all the time. But I do think it's interesting to consider how much it's just part of the language of Christians to say part of what we do is we are people who are very concerned about the poor. And that... This, and, and that that this should not be controversial, that if you talk about the poor, and that when this is talking about the poor, this has nothing to do with anything prior to like, you know, the 17th, 18th, or 19th century. It's been a long time that the, that the Bible's been talking about that. So it has nothing to do with whether, you know, you have certain flags or other flags in your house. 
right? And I think that's really important because there are people, and it happens with some of our students, if somebody starts talking about poverty, they go, oh, are you a Marxist? And the point is, is that what's going on in catechesis where it's just reflexive to say that part of what we do as Christians is we at least are attentive to the reality of poverty. And it should not be controversial. So what's happening with catechesis, with formation, so that part of what people just say is part of what they express as Christians is to say, it's important for us to remember the poor, to see them and to attend to them. And if nothing else, Jesus seemed to think it was really important in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. I mean, do you want to be a sheep or do you want to be a goat? Or if you want to be a sheep, then you got to be looking after the poor, right? So, so I, 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 you know, people who are purportedly biblicist of all people should be the ones who say, you know, I really probably should be thinking about that. And maybe I don't think about that enough. So yeah, I, I think it should be part of our catechesis.